I have had enough people, I can't do this anymore. So then what's the point? He's just some corrupted hot man? Not my Kaz and Inej, not them. This is not me trying to discourage you from watching it. I just needed to get my feelings out. Hello everyone, welcome. So, Shadow and Bone season two recently ended and I have a lot, a lot of thoughts. A lot more than I thought I would have actually. And I never planned to make this video. I thought I might do like a reaction video to like the first couple episodes or something, but decided to scrap that because there's just so much. You can never fully judge something by just the first episodes. And I didn't want to make one for every single one. And then I didn't know how I was going to feel by the end, but then I watched the whole thing and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. And unfortunately not in the good way. And so I need to complain. So here we are. <laughs> I had originally made a video for season one of the show back when it first came out, but then I ended up scrapping that video because I honestly didn't have too much to say. Like I enjoyed season one. I had a great time with that season. It has flaws for sure, but it was really fun for me to watch. And I thought it was a fairly faithful adaptation. And I loved the book series. I made a whole video rereading the original Shadow and Bone trilogy. I have an old, old review of Crooked Kingdom that I made right when it came out. And Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom is like one of my all time favorite, favorite fantasy series in the world. I love those books so much. I love those characters. So I was so excited for season two of this show to come out. I'd been anticipating it so highly. I rewatched season one multiple times and I was so, so excited for this season. And then I watched it. Yeah, needless to say, this video will include full spoilers for season one and two of Shadow and Bone, as well as the Grisha trilogy and the Six of Crows duology in their entirety. I can't talk about this without talking about all of those. I haven't read King of Scars and Rule of Wolves, so no spoilers for those, even though people have spoiled me for one thing in that, so please don't spoil me any further. I haven't read those two. But yeah, the original trilogy and the Six of Crows duology, I'll be talking about those, as well as spoilers for every episode of Shadow and Bone season two. So if you haven't watched it yet and you don't want to be spoiled, if you haven't read it and you don't know about certain plot points in the books either and you don't want to be spoiled for those then feel free to click out but I just need to get all my thoughts out because there are just so many things so many things I can't I can't stop thinking about I need to know if I'm alone I can't be I know I'm not the only one who feels this way I know there have been very mixed reviews on the entire season from a lot of people I've talked to some people about it too I just I need to vent okay I love this book series so dearly it means so much to me so to watch them do what they did, make the decisions they made, hurt. It hurt quite a bit. <laughs> uh, where to begin? <laughs> so I wasn't able to watch the show the day that it came out. I had to watch like a couple days later. So I had already seen a couple people talking about how they felt a bit weird and iffy about the finale of the season. So I had already lowered my expectations a little bit because people I really trusted were saying that the final episode was kind of weird. So I expected that going into it, but I was still really, really excited. So with season two, I expected a bit more of the same. I was a bit more apprehensive because we were gonna touch the Crows storyline this time. And in the first season, we didn't actually get into any of the Crows plot. So we were just making all of that up as we went along. But this time around, I knew we were going to actually get into to some of the Six of Crows storyline and stuff. So I was just a little bit worried about how we would handle that. But I'm gonna talk about this by separating the Shadow and Bone plot from the Six of Crows plot, because despite the fact that the story tried to mesh the two together in a way that made literally no sense, even for someone who's read all of the books, I think it'll be more logical to talk about them separately. So let's tackle the Shadow and Bone characters first, shall we? Barring a couple of like, you know, little kind of cheesy moments and dumb things that happened like the scene in the first episode of the season where Alina is using that magnifying glass to look at a map that is so big that she does not need a magnifying glass for. And like little moments like that, <laughs> that were just kind of funny, but I can overlook like it, it's fine. It's not that important. Before we got to the very last episode, overall, I was pretty satisfied with what we were getting from the Shadow and Bone plot, there were definitely some changes. And partway through is when you start to realize, oh, we're about to combine both Siege and Storm and Ruin and Rising into one season. Because Shadow and Bone season one was just Shadow and Bone. But this time we literally got four books 
in one story. I know we didn't actually touch the majority of the Crows and Crooked Kingdom plot, like the actual plot points that happen in those two, like we didn't get the heist and everything, but we still put those two books into this as well. And it was a lot in one season. I think that was the biggest issue. It was overwhelming for the story. I don't think you can fit four books into one season of a show, eight episodes at that too, episodes that are sometimes not even an hour long. That's a lot of story to fit into one season. So I think that really, really overwhelmed the season. So it made it convoluted and confusing. Even as somebody who has read the book, I honestly think that I'm curious to know actually for anyone who watched it who hasn't read the books, was it confusing for you? Because it was confusing for me. My friend and I watched it together and we described it like it was as if somebody had taken random pages from all four of those books, tore them out and then put them in a bowl and then you just like randomly selected them out and then rearranged them. Like that's, that's what it felt like they were doing with the plot of this season and it was messy. It was very, very very messy. There were just so many jumps where you would go from like one scene where something like major is happening, like either a battle or like a really emotional moment, and then you just jump to something else and then jump back in a way that made literally no sense. Like there was no reason for us to interrupt this action that was going on here with like another scene that is not relevant to this moment whatsoever. The editing was just kind of odd in that sense. And I really think that all of this is because they don't know if they're gonna get renewed for a second season. I actually think a lot of the problems with the season is because they don't know if they're gonna get renewed for another season, so they were trying to fit everything into one season just in case they don't get another season. But I think it really backfired in some ways. I was glad that we got more of an emphasis on the crows this season because let's be honest, they are who everybody is watching for. <laughs> Despite the fact that I love the Shadow and Bone series and I love Alina and I love Mal, I was also happy that we were getting more of the crows because they're also my all-time favorites. But in a lot of ways, I do feel like we neglected the Shadow and Bone storyline. I really liked the early moments that we got between Alina and Mal. They really, really wanted people to like Mal in the show. So they kind of, I feel like, pushed it a bit too hard in a way that I don't think actually worked. Personally, honestly, I like book Mal better than show Mal because he has more agency. You kind of understand him as a person better. And I feel like in the show, they're just trying a little too hard to make him seem like the good guy because they want people to like him over the Darkling because they know everybody likes the Darkling more which is a whole a whole other conversation. So I really think they're trying too hard to get the audience to like Mal. And I think that might be why they made the choice they made at the end, but we'll get there because that's my biggest gripe. But yeah, the early scenes between Alina and Mal were completely fine. I enjoyed them. I liked a lot of the early stuff, but it was like, I think maybe halfway through the show or so when you start to realize that they are combining both books into one, that all of it just kind of started to fall apart a little. Like the stakes were suddenly not as high as they should have been, or at least it didn't feel that way to me. We were wasting time with these pointless battle sequences, some of which were really well choreographed, others that were just not. Like that one scene, I don't even remember what episode it is, but it's like with Nikolai and that other hot guy who's his friend who dies, and then all the Grisha, like the Darklings Grisha, who are just marching. That was awkward. It was weird. And who was that girl with the horrible bangs who was leading all of them? Why was she getting so much screen time? What was the point of her? We could have spent so much more time on the other characters like Jenya or David and developed that a little bit more or even given more time to the crows or Matthias because like she did not need to be there. There was just so much wasted screen time but I hated that battle sequence. It took too long and I still don't even know what was going on. Okay hi sorry to interrupt but um there were a couple of things that I forgot to mention while I was filming the video so you're gonna see me occasionally throughout this video in this other outfit because I just needed to add a couple more things. I just wanted to say here that there were actually a couple of the um, fight scenes that I thought were really really well choreographed which was odd because some of them were so poorly choreographed like that one that I just mentioned but some of them were really really well done like Jesper's scenes for example were all incredible. Every single fight scene that Kaz had, chef's kiss, iconic, some of the greatest scenes in the entire season. <laughs> all the fight scenes with Inej, I really liked all of those. So it was so weird to have some really well choreographed scenes and then some really poorly choreographed scenes because they truly just did not feel like they were made by the same person. The other thing that I think was a waste of screen time, the Darkling. <laughs> the Darkling did not feel like the villain of the season. He literally just stood in the background and coughed most of the time. <laughs> ben Barnes had way more screen time than he needed, but also the screen time that he had was such a waste of time. He didn't feel like the Darkling. He didn't feel scary and menacing and evil. Like he just was some guy. 
And that was really disappointing. <laughs> For example, when the Darkling attacks the orphanage in the book, I was terrified reading that scene. It's so disturbing. It haunts you and it shocks you in a lot of ways. When we watch it in the show, I really felt little to nothing uh, because he wasn't intimidating. He wasn't scary. There's that scene where he like attacks Alina and everything, but it wasn't the same. And the line when he says like, I will take all that you have, strip you of everything that you know or whatever um, until you have nothing but me. That line from the book, when I read that, I was sick to my stomach. It was horrifying. But when he says it in the show, I felt nothing. It wasn't scary. It was more disappointing than the make me your villain line from season one. And I just feel like there was so much more that we could have been doing with the Darkling. And instead, every scene we got with him was just a complete waste. When I read the books, I hated the Darkling. Everything that he does makes you feel so angry and upset and emotional and confused. Like, he's such a complex villain. He's such a well-written villain. In this, he was not intimidating in the least. He was so boring and he didn't really do anything at all. Honestly, the girl with the bangs was doing his whole job for him. And that was so disappointing to me because it's such a wasted opportunity for such a great, great villain to make him just so dull. I honestly, the entire time I was watching, I was like, what is he doing? Because like, he didn't do anything. He walked into the fold like at the end just to face Alina. Besides that, he was just kind of standing around. That's really it. <laughs> I enjoyed the fact that they didn't put too much of the um, Nikolai and Mal conflict into the story. I liked that they kind of made them friends in this. That was fun. Despite the fact that I still think it really works in the book, I know that they were trying to obviously make Mal more likable and also they didn't want to take too much away uh, by adding in all of that relationship drama between the three of them. So I enjoyed that. And overall, I was enjoying my time watching the show. Despite these criticisms, it was still a good time. And then we got to that last episode. <laughs> and I knew, like I said, to expect something weird, something that was probably going to be upsetting, but I didn't expect it to be, I think, as bad as it ended up being, or for me to be as upset as I am now. <laughs> My number one thing that I did not want them to change at the end of the story, which I think is a controversial opinion because I know a lot of people hate this about the final book in the Shadow and Bone trilogy, but I wanted Alina to lose her powers. Alina has to give up her powers when she kills Mal and kills the Darkling. She has to lose her powers. That's the whole point of the story. And I know people always complain when the main character loses her powers at the end of the story, worst trope ever. It's terrible, I hate it. I also hate it in a lot of things, but in Shadow and Bone, Alina losing her powers is so essential to the message of that story that if you allow her to keep her powers, you strip the story of its message. The point of Alina losing her powers is that one, she never needed this power to be important, to be powerful, to be special, the way the Darkling had convinced her that her power was the thing that made her special. But Mal always told her that it wasn't her power that made her special. She was already special because she was her. Her powers didn't define her. She never wanted this power. She saw the repercussions of what seeking power like that can do to a person. And she knows what the consequences of that type of power is. She has lived through this war and she has seen what it has done to the people she loves and to everybody else. And she gives up that power. Her powers are then given to the other people of Ravka. So then other people have sun magic. She literally distributes her wealth distributes her power to the people, quite literally. And then she and Mal fake their deaths so that they can go and live back at the orphanage they were raised on to raise all of the children who lived there so that they can have their own quiet life away from this war, away from everything because they've sacrificed everything already. Like that's the point of the ending, okay? That's what it's supposed to be. That's the feeling you're supposed to get. She has to give up all of this in order to finally find some kind of peace in order to finally be able to heal. And that's the beauty of that ending. Okay, it's so good. I love the ending of that series. And in this, she keeps her power. And not only does she keep her power, she uses dark magic to resurrect Mal. She is not the one who resurrects Mal, much less with dark magic. My theory is that they probably, I mean, hopefully, unless I'm completely wrong, and only if we get another season, we won't know this unless we do get another season. My theory is they're just trying to extend out the ending, so she might end up actually sacrificing her powers and going off with Mal and like living at the orphanage as they're supposed to eventually, like at the end of the next season, if we were to get another one. I think they're just trying to draw it out. But even if that is the case, even if they do ultimately intend for her to lose her powers, they still made her resurrect Mal using dark magic. And the reason this upsets me so much is because it clearly seems like they're trying to imply that she's being a little bit corrupted by this magic and that she's going to have like a little bit of a villain arc herself. And I hate it specifically because of what this implies 
for the Darkling because I think this is a way to excuse the Darkling's actions and his behavior as a villain. If we're implying that this dark magic is corrupting Alina, then you can very easily draw the conclusion that the Darkling is only doing what he's doing and was only acting the way he was acting because he was being corrupted by dark magic, not because he's a terrible person and a manipulative, like, ancient man who has just gaslit and manipulated tons of young girls throughout his time. That's why he's evil. I think there's a distinct difference between power corrupting a person and then a person being corrupted because they seek power. And that's the distinction with the Darkling. He's corrupt not because the power is is corrupting him. He is corrupt because he seeks power in order to use it over others. That's the difference. He's meant to represent a very specific archetype of person and to strip that away, to strip away the fact that he's bad because he's choosing to hurt these people, because he doesn't care about who he hurts in order to gain what he wants, to strip that away and excuse it by saying that he's only doing this or that he's as bad as he is because it's the dark magic that's like corrupting his soul or something is horrible, absolutely horrible horrible. It takes every ounce of nuance and depth and meaning that he as a character and as a villain has away. It takes all of it away. So then what's the point? He's just some corrupted hot man? Like, no! <laughs> and I'm so mad. I feel like that is what they're gonna do and if it doesn't get renewed for another season, that is what they did and we'll never have a chance to correct that or, you know, add to it so that we can understand what it is they're actually trying to do because I don't know so much is up in the air. I want another season, but at the same time, if that's the direction we're gonna go in, I don't want another season. I'd rather they just not touch it. So again, I don't know if they are just trying to extend out the Mal and Alina thing. If that's what they're going for, sure, but I still hate, I still hated that. Like, it was just so anticlimactic when the Darkling died and when Mal was resurrected and when he died. Like, it, there was just nothing going on. So much of it was anticlimactic. Like, when they killed the Sea Whip, I didn't realize they had already killed the Sea Whip. It happened so fast and we just got over it and moved on so quickly. Everything in the season moved so quickly. But again, I really do think that's because they don't know if they're gonna get renewed or not. Like, nobody can trust Netflix when it comes to that. So you can definitely blame that on the fact that everything's up in the air. But even though we can say that's the reason, it's still made for very convoluted storytelling. And personally, if I were worried about my show being canceled, I'd rather go out on a bang than mashing absolutely every single storyline we have into one. But I'm so serious. If they don't end up making Alina lose her powers by the end, what will have been the point? So much of the point of that story is that Alina loses her powers and she sacrifices them specifically. She gives them up for everyone else. And if she doesn't do that, what is the point? But the other part of the ending, in the shadow and bone side of things that really just got me, really made me so upset was the whole Mal situation. Mal being like, I don't know if you and I only feel what we feel because of destiny, because we were drawn together. So I need to go find myself. Peace out. I'm gonna go on my own little ship. I'm gonna turn into a privateer like uh, Nikolai. I'm gonna become Sturmond and I I'm just gonna live his life now and you know, go have some fun times by myself. That didn't need to happen. It just, it didn't need to happen. And again, I do think that that's because they're just trying to draw out this entire thing with Mal and Alina. I think they just want to have the actors for another season. Otherwise Mal and Alina would have to leave. So would the Darkling and they want Ben Barnes employed. So they're just trying to draw all of this out a little bit longer by also simultaneously mashing everything up into one. So it really makes no sense, but whatever. I think it was like very, third act breakup E, which was so boring and I hate when they do that. But more than anything, you wanna know why I hate it? I hate it because of Inej, because of what they did with the Crows storyline. And now we have to go into the Crows storyline because oh my God, <laughs> the fact that we took the ending of Crooked Kingdom, the arguably, inarguably actually, the greatest part of the entire Six of Crows duology, the fact that we end that series with Kaz doing the most romantic, incredible thing anyone has ever done for anyone else ever in the history of time, finding Inez's family for her, reuniting her with them, buying her her own ship so she can be the captain of her own ship, so she can go off and find all of these slavers and get her justice, the fact that they just put her on Mal's ship when that is supposed to be her ship. I am enraged. I am enraged. Oh my god. I was so angry. The fact that they would take that pivotal, beautiful moment away from us to just 
put her on this ship and separate her from the crows for no reason so she can become a part of another crew when that's supposed to be her ship why would you do that what was the point oh my god i was so angry there was no reason for her to be on there and then when she gets on that ship and uh not i don't remember his name tamar's brother holds her hand and is like clearly flirting with her helping her get on the ship if they try and turn kaz and inej into a love triangle i am out i am out I am done. I have had enough people. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> not my Kaz and Inesh. Not them. Do anything you want to anyone else, but not them. Don't touch that. Oh my god, I was so angry. I just feel like they did Inej so dirty. She deserved so much more. We barely go into any of her backstory, which is understandable if we plan to do it in future seasons, but that's only if we get future seasons or if we get the Six of Crows spinoff. Do I want it? Yes but don't give us that love triangle, I will riot. But so in this season, we really barely get any of her backstory. So we don't really fully understand Inej as a character unless you've already read the books. So you can apply the knowledge that you have and you understand the context for certain things that are said and certain looks and certain choices that she makes. And I think that was another major problem with the entire show as well. It felt like a lot of the time they expected the audience to have already read the story, which I'm sure the majority of the people who've watched this are people who loved the books and read the books, but it just doesn't make for great storytelling when you're relying on the audience to have prior knowledge from somewhere else in order to understand your story. It makes it really confusing and again I'd be very curious to know how people who haven't read the books felt watching it because I feel like you're just missing out on a lot and you might not be like super confused but you're just not you're really not going to understand certain things unless you already know these characters. So I really did enjoy certain Kaz and Inej scenes that we got in the story but honestly that's I think mostly just because I love them so much as characters. It's not because the scenes themselves themselves were really great or really well written. They were very well acted. I have to give so much credit to all of the crows, honestly, but Freddie Carter, oh my god, he carried this entire season on his back playing Kaz. He put everything into being Kaz. Kaz was Kaz. Kaz was Kaz and that was incredible. And Inej was Inej in a lot of moments. Amita was doing everything she could. You could tell she understands Inej as a character. She's read the books, she understands her fully, and you could feel that every time she was acting. So the acting, fantastic. I had no issues with that at all. I love the cast. I think the cast is perfect, especially for the crows. But like I was saying, a lot of the Kaz and Inej moments lose their depth because one, the moments don't feel earned. And the reason that the romance works so well for me is because we spend so much time dedicated time learning about these characters and understanding who they are, understanding why they are the way they are and why they make the choices they make. And they earn each other's respect. They earn each other's love. And we watch that happen. And that didn't happen in this. We just had them go through very quickly, actually, all the emotional development they go through in those two books, but for no reason at all, because we didn't have any of the major plot points. I just didn't get how we got there based on just the events in the show. I can apply my knowledge again of the books to the show and then understand it. But if you don't have that, then why? Why were they feeling the way they felt about each other? Why was it suddenly so intense? And we also don't understand why it's so intense because again, we barely have anything about Inej's backstory. This was also extremely true for Wylan and Jesper. I didn't hate the fact that we made them already know each other, kind of have like a one night stand thing going on and then reconnect. That was okay, except for the fact that it just sped everything along so quickly, where again, I had the same problem. Like I felt like we didn't earn their relationship. Like we don't understand them yet. It just doesn't make sense why they feel so intensely about each other when we don't get to learn about why they feel so intensely about each other. It just made it feel really shallow and so I was really disappointed in that. And then of course with Matthias and Nina, the fact that she was like, I need to save the man I love in like episode one, I was like, girl, you don't love him yet. What are you talking about? <laughs> they just really rushed everything so, so much. And then Matthias being in prison the entire time, it was a lot, but it just felt like such a disservice to Matthias's character to just have him in that prison the entire time and his storyline be so cut off from the rest of the crows. It didn't make any sense. And it was just all so, so rushed. Jumping back to Kaz and Inej really quick, there was the scene at the very end of the last episode where Inej says her famous line, I'll have you without armor or I won't have you at all. I love that scene in the book 
book, but I feel like in the show, it kind of misrepresented what she meant when she said that. Because in this context, if you align it with the hallucination she had, when they're all having those hallucinations, when they're trapped and there's that flower that's like poisoning them all. And she hallucinates that moment with Kaz where he's like taking his gloves off and he holds her hands and then she is like afraid to hope for this. And then he asks her later, what did you see in the hallucination? And she says, hope is a dangerous thing or something like that, which was like a quote he said to her in season one. When we take the context of that into the scene where she says, I'll have you without armor, or I won't have you at all. And because we don't have the full extent of Kaz's backstory or the full extent of her backstory, it kind of feels like when she's talking about him without armor, she means almost exclusively like the fact that he can't touch her or can't kiss her. That's what that scene read like to me when I was watching it, but that's not what it reads like when you read the book. The last person on earth who would tell Kaz, I can't be with you because you can't touch me or would have a problem with someone not being able to touch them, it would be Inej. Inej would never care. Inej would not care in the slightest about that. The reason she says that to him is not because he can't touch her. It's because he can't get over this anger and hatred and like need for revenge that he has in his heart. And it's guarding him. It's armored him completely. The other thing with that line is that in the book, she's talking about both of their traumas. Inej also needs to work on her own armor and how difficult it has been for her. So she's not exclusively telling Kaz that he needs to work on himself. She's also talking about how she needs to do this for herself. She needs to find her own freedom. Then she can also come back without her armor. So that line is about the two of them and in the context of the show I feel like you don't really get that because we don't know enough about Inez yet. And in the context of the show it almost feels like she's shaming him for not being able to physically touch her. And that's so not Inej, especially when it's immediately followed up by the scene of her getting onto that ship and that guy like holding her hand. That's what it feels like you're saying. That's such a disservice to Inej. She would never mean it in that way and that's what it felt like they were saying. And I hated it. It made me so upset. <laughs> they just took one of the best lines, one of the best moments in the whole book and turned it into something kind of shallow. And that's not at all what it was. I know that some of these things feel nitpicky, but to me, it just changes the entire meaning of the story, our entire understanding of these characters, and it's just, it misrepresents them. And that's just so frustrating. And also the other thing that bothered me about the hallucination scene specifically, like Inej's hallucination, it's supposed to be kind of like their biggest fears, right? That they're hallucinating, apart from Jesper, who had a great time seeing his mom. That was actually very cute. And in that moment, her biggest fear is that like her and Kaz can't be together because of everything that he's going through and how guarded he is. And this is, might be like a little bit more nitpicky, but as someone who's like Inej Goff is like number one stan, okay, it bothered me a lot because Inej's number one fear is not that her and Kaz can't touch or be together in that way. Her biggest fear is that Kaz won't need her anymore. And the second that he doesn't need her, he'll discard her. Her biggest fear is that she will become useless to him and he won't need her. That's her fear. Not that she can't be with him or that she can't touch him or that he doesn't want to touch her or something like that. And like maybe again, in another season, in a Six of Crows spinoff, we could actually go into that. I may be preemptively judging this, who knows? We can't tell until we get another season. But based on all we have now, this is how I feel because that's just, that's not her fear. Her fear is that he won't need her anymore because there's that scene in, I think Crooked Kingdom when I think it's Vanek who uh, kidnaps Inej. I can't remember who kidnaps Inej. It's been a long time, but whoever it is, when they kidnap Inej, they like cut her somewhere or like hurt her somewhere. They injure her specifically in a way where she thinks she might not be able to use her daggers anymore. And so she's worried that she's going to become useless to Kaz. And if he has no need for her, then he's going to discard her. He's going to get rid of her. That's her fear. That's what's driving her this entire time in regards to her feelings about and her relationship with Kaz. And in a lot of other ways too, that's just like a core fear that she has. And so to make that moment just like, oh, like we can never have this, like him taking his gloves off, we can never touch like this, was so, again, so superficial. Like that's not, that's not at all what it is. I felt like so much of this season lacked the nuance that the books have, which makes sense that always happens when you adapt something. You always lose a lot of the nuance because books are not movies and shows, shows and movies are not books. Like they're completely different mediums. They serve different purposes and they present things to us in different ways. But these little things 
things, like the nuance of these characters is so essential to who they are that I felt like the characters almost didn't feel like themselves sometimes. Like they looked like themselves, the aesthetics were great, they looked like the crows and a lot of the times acted like the crows, but overall they were just like 2D versions of them, if that makes sense. They didn't feel fully fleshed out like the characters we all know and love so much. And so I was just... <laughs> I just wanted so much more out of them. And I know I'm spending most of my time talking about Kaz and Inej with the crows, but I felt the same about Jesper and Wylan. There was no development of their feelings, not just for each other, but their own emotional development either. And it felt so hollow and it felt so empty. It felt like I was reading kind of mediocre fan fiction about some of my favorite characters. Like I know them so I can apply my knowledge of them to the characters, but the writing itself was really, really hollow and really bare bones. And it just felt so lacking in so many ways to me. And I was so disappointed. Other thing I quickly want to mention is that recently Shadow and Bone released some like deleted scenes on their social media pages. And they released a deleted scene between Jesper and Inej having a conversation about her leaving. And oh my God, <laughs> That scene, that deleted scene, is the best scene in the entire season. And I can't believe they cut it because that's what we could have had. And instead, we got more of the Darkling coughing and moping around. <laughs> the dynamic between Jesper and Inej is such an essential one in the books and the fact that we could have had that, we could have had it because they know, clearly they know, they wouldn't have written it and directed it if they didn't know. They know and they still chose not to put it in there. That's what we deserved. Please just give us the crows show. It's all I want. It's all I want, but please do it justice. <laughs> Barring that last episode, I did have a good time watching it for the most part. I think season one was better, even though there are more of the crows in this season. I liked their scenes more, but as a whole, I definitely liked season one better. It was just more cohesive. It made more sense as a story. This was too messy. So I still had some fun and I enjoyed it a bit, but that last episode really just turned everything on its head and ruined so many of the essential parts of this series to me and this world and these characters. And it really, really left a bad taste in my mouth. Again, I'm really hoping, because I do want another season. Like I want more. So I am rooting for more. Um, this is not me trying to discourage you from watching it. I just needed to get my feelings out. I do want more. I'm hoping if we do get more, we can right some of these wrongs. We can fix some of these issues because there are quite a few of them. And I think they're very integral issues. And hopefully if we get renewed for another season, Season. It won't be as rushed because maybe they'll like renew a couple more seasons so we know how long the story will get. But who knows? Again, with Netflix, you never know and the chance of it getting cancelled is very high. So I don't know. I want more of the crows. I do like watching and reading things and like looking at them as separate entities whenever we get adaptations of things because they really are different and that's fine. I never need something to be exact. It's just when you tweak these things that are essential to the story that I get frustrated because those things were the core of the story and to change those changes everything. It's not even the same story anymore. You're not adapting that actual story. You're making something up essentially. And I'm also extra picky when it's something that I deeply, deeply love like this. So yeah. Anyway, those are pretty much all of my thoughts, I think, on Shadow and Bone season two. I'm very curious to know what you all think. Please let me know all your thoughts down below. I hope that you enjoyed it maybe a little bit more than I did, but I do also want to know if anyone felt the same way that I did too, because I know how many of you feel the same way as me and love these characters with your whole heart and soul. So I need to hear all your thoughts. So feel free to discuss everything. If I missed anything, let me know. I know there are other things that I definitely forgot to mention because there was a lot. It was it was long. It was simultaneously way too short and also long. So there's a lot I could have missed. But yeah, that's my piece for now. I think I just need to go reread the books and just live in that for a while. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media, all my links are in the description box as always. But thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!